High Vietnam, to which John Van returned in late March 1965, was a nation on the threshold of the most violent war in its history. At the beginning of the month, Lyndon Johnson had started Operation Rolling Thunder, the bombing campaign against North Vietnam. Two U.S. Marine battalions, the first of many to follow, had landed at Da Nang to secure the airfield there as one of the staging bases for the bombing raids. At May CV headquarters in Saigon, William Dupuy, then a brigadier general and General William Westmoreland's chief, had taken the first step in the planning that was to bring hundreds of thousands of U.S. troops into South Vietnam with artillery and armor and fleets of fighter bombers for a new American war to destroy the Vietnamese communists and their followers. We are going to stomp them to death, Dupuy predicted. The phone in the room of the Saigon Hotel where Van was temporarily staying rang early on the first day after his return, Sunday, March 1965. It was Cao. In his complicated way, Van kept friendships with the Vietnamese he got to know, despite the worst of quarrels. Cao was no exception. He was grateful for an offer of financial help Van had made from Denver in the months immediately after Diem's demise, when it appeared that Chow might be thrown out of the ARVN and lose the means to support his wife and many children. Van had known that Chow had little in the way of personal savings, because one of Chow's few professional virtues was relative honesty in the handling of funds. Van had asked Lodge's assistant and Bob York to do what they could for Chow, and to let Chow know that he could count on Van for money until he found another livelihood. As it turned out, Chow had not needed the help. He had managed to ingratiate himself with a number of his fellow Saigon generals amid the political turmoil that had operations, set in after Lodge had despaired of the lackadaisical junta that had overthrown Diem and had permitted them to be overthrown in turn by Lieutenant General Nguyen Khan, the ambitious graduate of the French Army Paratroop School. Khan, too, had finally been driven from power. His plane had literally run out of gas over Nha Trang while he was trying to stay aloft to avoid resigning and forced into exile only a month before Van's return. The group currently on top was the so-called Young Turk faction of generals dominated by Air Vice Marshal Nguyen Chao Ki, the commander of the VNF. Huyen Van Cao's principal asset was that he did not threaten any of the other generals. The Sekorj Minking member of the Young Turk faction, Brigadier General Nguyen Van Thieu, also happened to be another central Vietnamese Catholic. Chao had been serving as Director of Psychological Warfare for the Joint General Staff. He told Van excitedly that just the day before the Council of Generals had chosen him to be the new Chief of Staff of the JGS, the second-ranking position after the Chief. He wanted to know if Van could come out to his house in the JGS compound near the airport for dinner that evening. Van said he would be happy to come. Cao spent much of the dinner filling Van in on the cooping and countercooping by the Generals and their civilian political allies of the moment and on the street, riots by the Buddhist and Catholic factions that had occupied the capital for the last two years, while the Viet Cong had grown ever more menacing in the countryside. Despite his elevation the day before by the other Saigon generals, Cao remained Chao. He was fearful that as chief of staff he might be drawn into an intrigue against his will. Absence had not diminished Van's capacity to observe his former counterpart. It is evident that Chao never has and never will participate in a coup, Van wrote that night in the diary he kept intermittently for the first six months after his return. He is deathly afraid and does his best to straddle the fence on all issues. Chow was relieved when the military council changed its mind shortly afterward and he was allowed to stay chief of psychological warfare. Van got a contrasting reception on Monday morning at the Saigon office of the U.S. Operations Mission, USOM, as AID was then called in Vietnam. While AID's Washington headquarters was eagerly recruiting retired military men to staff its pacification program, its civilian bureaucrats in Vietnam were fearful that their agency was going to be taken over by the military. Retired officers like Van were regarded as infiltrators. The only man to welcome him was the infiltrator on loan from the Army to run the program, Colonel Sam Wilson, who had persuaded Taylor to let Van return. AID Washington had managed to bring Van into government as a gradage in the Foreign Service Reserve, a rank between lieutenant colonel and colonel in the Army, sufficiently senior for him to be a director of USOM operations in one of the South's four core regions. Wilson informed Van that in addition to Taylor's instruction that Van serve as an ordinary province representative, 
the chief of AI in Vietnam, James Killen, had reserved all of the regional directorships for civilian career men like himself. Van would have to display his worth in the field and then move upward, possibly to become deputy director of a region in summer. The previous fall, Westmoreland had designated the six provinces surrounding Saigon as the priority area for pacification. With Van's talents in mind, Wilson was thinking of sending him to a relatively new province, Haungia, the most insecure of the six. Haungia, west of Saigon between the capital and the Cambodian border, was approximately 500 square miles of wild reeds, rice paddies, and fields of sugarcane. Nearly a quarter of a million Vietnamese peasants lived there. Diem had established the province as one of his last official acts by putting together the four most troublesome districts of three adjoining provinces. His hope had been to eradicate trouble by consolidating it. The result for his successors had been a whole province that mocked the name Diem had given it. Hao Nghia, a Vietnamese literary term, means deepening righteousness. The province was considered strategic because the so-called Parrot's Beak section of Cambodia, thrust into South Vietnam at this point, and put central Saigon less than 35 air miles east of the border. Hao Nghia was also a natural route of north-south movement for the Viet Cong. It lay between the rice lands and the plain of reeds in the Mekong Delta, and the rubber plantation country, and the beginning of the rainforest of the Annamite foothills above Saigon. A week after his initial meeting with Wilson, when his assignment had been confirmed and he had finished his processing, Van went to the embassy for a political briefing on the province. The political section could not find its sparse file on Haungia, and he left. Ten minutes, Chakta. Later, two Viet Cong terrorists arrived under the CIA office on the second floor to retaliate for the bombing of the North. The terrorists had pounds of plastic explosive packed into an old gray Peugeot sedan. Embassy officials had been warned repeatedly over the last couple of years to block the streets around the building to traffic and to take other simple precautions, such as substituting shatterproof plexiglass for the ordinary glass of the windows. Neither Lodge nor Taylor had done anything effective, afraid that showing fear might cause the United States to lose face. The plastic explosive was the best American kind called C4, captured or bought from the Saigon side, as was the detonator a quick-fuse type known as a time pencil. The old car became a massive grenade, sending shards of metal in every direction along with bits of concrete from a four-foot hole blown out of the pavement. The windows of the six-story building burst inward in myriads of fragments, along with the plaster and the wood and metal fixtures on the walls facing the street. Van rushed back at the sound of the explosion to help evacuate the injured. Most of the twenty dead were innocent Vietnamese passers-by and patrons and workers in an open-air restaurant and commercial offices across the street. Another 126 Vietnamese were wounded. The Vietnamese communists were now ignoring the carnage such urban terrorism caused among their own people, rationalizing it with warnings they regularly gave the population in leaflets and radio broadcasts to stay away from American buildings. The two terrorists were killed as well as several of the Saigon policemen guarding the building. One of the two Americans killed was a Navy petty officer. The other was a young woman who was a secretary to the CIA station chief. The station chief himself was gravely hurt and nearly lost both eyes. Two of his CIA officers were permanently blinded. A number of the other Uffi-1 men and women hurt inside the embassy were also horribly wounded, their faces torn. Van noticed that one hunk of concrete or metal was hurled up all six stories and ripped a large hole through the American flag on the roof. John Van left for Haungia the day after the attack on the embassy. He drove right through the province capital of Bao Tri before he realized that he had missed it and turned around. The place was, he wrote in his diary, the most unlikely-looking province capital in all Vietnam. The last time he had seen Bao Tri had been during an operation in early 1963. Two of Hao Nghia's four districts had been part of Long An Province in the old 7th Division Zone. It had been a Viet Cong-controlled hamlet of about 1,000 people then. Diem had selected it as the province capital because it happened to be at the junction of the dirt roads connecting three of the district centers. The population had nearly doubled with the arrival of soldiers for a garrison and wives and children and camp followers. Bao Tri had also gained a handful of buildings that were used as offices, 
and housing for the province officials and their American advisors. Diem had tried to abolish the plain country name, Bao Tri, means round farm, by bestowing one of his literary titles, Kim Kwong, which means modest but vigorous. The fancy name had not taken. Everyone continued to call the place Bao Tri. Despite the near doubling in population, Bao Tri was just about 200 yards across at the widest point where it straddled both sides of the road. Van looked again and recognized the hamlet of two years before. Closer inspection brought more discouragement. At a small compound in the center of town where the military advisors lived, he asked directions to the U.S. Ohm office. He was sent down a lane to a long, tin-roofed warehouse and walked inside to a completely disheartening sight. The warehouse was bursting with disorderly stacked piles of bulgur wheat, corn, shovels, paint, clothing, medical supplies, cooking oil, cement, dried milk, pitchforks, mattresses, chairs, chests, saws, angle iron lengths, nails, rice hullers, and miscellaneous items I later found came from the salvage yard. The man he was replacing, William Pye, a 52-year-old Army Reserve Lieutenant Colonel who had volunteered for AID and who was a brave and decent man but extremely tense and disorganized, was standing in the midst of this magpie's delight, pad and pen in hand, apparently inventorying some item. The USOM office consisted of a couple of desks in a corner of the warehouse. Van could see that the papers on the desktops were in as much disarray and covered with as much dust as everything else. He asked where the living quarters were and walked a short distance to a new bungalow of the inevitable masonry and stucco construction. On the outside, except for some useless barbed wire strung around it, the house was trimly built with wooden shutters. On the inside, it was the same grubby warren as the warehouse. There was no electricity for lights and fans, just gasoline lanterns that made the house hotter at night. Nor could Van look forward to relaxing at a meal. He had told himself that, to be effective, he was going to have to live with the Vietnamese. He had therefore decided not to take his meals with the U.S. military advisors at their mess. But when eating at the one restaurant in Bao Tri, Van wrote to a friend in Denver, it was very difficult to stick a bite of food in the mouth without the flies riding in with it. Flies were not the primary threat to the health of an American or Saigon official in Haungia. The USOM motor pool officer in Saigon had grumbled about letting Van borrow a station wagon to drive to Bao Tri. The man had been worried about getting his vehicle back. Van was the first Vietnamese or American official to drive unescorted from Saigon in many months. Everyone else traveled to and from Saigon and on all of the roads still open within the province in armed convoys. As the convoys were also frequently mined or ambushed, they traveled above the roads in helicopters whenever possible. The majority of the province was, in any case, no longer in contact with the Saigon side. The four districts had been reduced to three in mid-1964, when the fourth one, the northeast corner of the Plain of Reeds across the Vam Ko Dong River, had been abandoned entirely to the guerrillas. The district chief had been given three villages in another district to administer. By early 1965, when Van arrived, the direct roads between Bao Tri and two of the three remaining district centers had also been cut. It was likewise no longer possible to drive directly to Bao Tri from Saigon, even though the place was a mere 20 miles from the city. Van had been forced to take an indirect way that circled to the northwest up Route 1, the main road from Saigon to Cambodia, and then south down a secondary road from the town of Kuchi, the third district center in the province. Haungia was such a Siberia assignment, as Van put it, that the regime was currently unable to find a chief for the province. The last province chief had been jailed for complicity in the most recent abortive coup in February. The job had since been offered to two other ARVN officers, and both had refused it. With the exception of Bao Tri and the district towns, half a dozen hamlets, and the outposts that still existed at the sufferance of the guerrillas, Haungia had been ceded to the Viet Cong. Although Van's job for USOM was to supervise school building, hog raising, refugee relief, and similar civilian pacification projects, a vacuum of leadership and a confrontation were precisely the circumstances in which he thrived. He immediately began scheming to take Haung Gia back from the Viet Cong. He started organizing on his first night, convening a meeting with the acting province chief, a civilian Saigon official who was the deputy for administration to work out the province budget requirements for the coming fiscal year. 
The next morning, he was off to begin a tour of the district centers to meet the district chiefs and their American advisors and be briefed. Westmoreland had arranged in mid-1964 for the headquarters of the ARVN 25th Infantry Division and two of its regiments to be transferred to Haung Hia from central Vietnam. Van also stopped at the division headquarters and at one of the regimental command posts on his first morning. He learned that despite Westmoreland's priority designation, no one had drawn up a pacification plan for Haung Gia. They had to have one, Van said, and he initiated the process. He got Yu Som's Vietnamese work crew in Bao Tri busy bringing order to the warehouse and told the acting province chief that he had to have a respectable office in the province headquarters. The headquarters building with a large veranda was the only structure in town of any vague distinction. He told the assistant he found waiting for him in Bao Tri, Douglas Ramsey, a 30-year-old foreign service officer who had reached the province a month earlier, that they could not afford to surrender access to the population as the guerrillas wanted by staying off the roads and riding helicopters. Ramsey was a cheerful, gangling westerner of six feet three inches with black hair and a round-the-clock five o'clock shadow. He was a rarity among Americans in 1965, fluent in spoken and written Vietnamese. Convoys would not permit them the freedom of movement they needed either, Van said, and he thought they would actually be in less danger driving alone. The Viet Cong interdicted all official traffic and, whenever they wished, set up roadblocks to collect taxes from commercial trucks and to kidnap individual soldiers riding civilian buses. Otherwise, they permitted civilian vehicles to move freely on the roads that were still open. All of the U.S. home vehicles were civilian types. In addition to several large cargo trucks with Vietnamese drivers for hauling supplies, there were two smaller vehicles for Ramsey and Van to use. One was an international harvester scout with armor concealed in the body. The other was an unarmored pickup truck, also an international, painted a canary yellow. Van preferred the pickup because it was fast. The weight of the armor slowed down the scout. He believed they would be able to drive when and where they wanted and have a reasonable chance of staying alive if they kept their pattern as irregular as possible and checked with the local police or militia before starting down a stretch of road. Most of Ramsey's previous work in Vietnam had not been dangerous, but he had done some operating in the countryside, and he was game. Within a week and a half, Van no longer had to do battle with the flies in Bao Tri's restaurant. He and Ramsey were invited by the province officials and military officers to join the communal Vietnamese mess. The officials and officers had organized a mess because the lack of decent housing and the insecurity kept them from bringing their families to Bao Tri. The inclusion of the Americans meant that the Vietnamese would eat better. Van and Ramsey could purchase food from the commissary in Saigon. The invitation would not have been extended, however, had the Vietnamese decided they did not like Van. He was delighted, because mealtimes were an opportunity to settle problems and talk up new programs. Van also did not anticipate any conflict with the senior American military advisor in the province, a young lieutenant colonel named Lloyd Webb, who knew Van by reputation and respected his experience. Near the end of April, a new province chief arrived, Major Nguyen Tri Han, a Southern Catholic who had previously been a deputy province chief in the rubber plantation country. He had been promised a quick promotion to lieutenant colonel to induce him to accept Hao Nghia. He was a husky man of 45 years with a stolid temperament, and he was a surprise. Han was straightforward in manner, appeared honest, and seemed sincerely committed to governing the province well. I'll have him in the palm of my hand in 30 days, Van predicted to Ramsey. Two nights later, the Viet Cong reminded Van that goodwill and hard work would not by themselves suffice to rescue Hao Nghia or to win the war in the rest of South Vietnam. He had understood this, but in the strongly positive mood in which he approached any new task, he had not faced up to the implications of what he had been seeing around him. At 2.30 a.m. on April 28, 1965, the guerrillas brought him to fuller awareness. They started firing mortar shells into Bao Tri to discourage the artillerymen there from supporting an ARVN ranger company the Viet Cong were assaulting at that same moment at a hamlet two miles away. Radio contact with the company was lost immediately. When Van drove to the hamlet early in the morning, he found the company annihilated. Thirty-five rangers dead, sixteen missing and captured, and eleven wounded survivors left behind by the attackers. 
The assault force was one of those armed by Harkin's nightmares Van had had at 7th Division, elements of a regional guerrilla battalion rich in American machine guns and other automatic and semi-automatic weapons, its heavier recoilless cannons and mortars smuggled in by sea from the north. The Viet Cong, who had been fortunate to possess a couple of machine guns for a battalion in 1962, now had three in each platoon, the same as in the U.S. Army. The guerrillas had hardly needed to employ their heavy armament, despite the fact that another ranger company had been lost at the same hamlet the previous October, the officers and non-coms of this company had not taken the most elementary precautions. No outer listening posts had been organized or trip flares set up, and no foxholes had been dug for a perimeter defense. The company had simply bedded down for the night around a house near the elementary school at one end of the hamlet. The peasants said that the rangers had been asleep. Van had already surmised this, because most of the dead wore only undershorts, and he counted eleven men who had been shot in the face while they were apparently still lying unawares. Women and children from the hamlet had come with torches as soon as the attack was over, Van learned, and picked up the weapons of the rangers for the guerrillas. The women and children had also helped to carry off several wounded guerrillas and two Viet Cong who had been killed by the few rangers who woke up in time to fight. The rangers were detested by the population in the vicinity for their abuse. Van noticed that the guerrillas were careful not to harm any of the other houses in the hamlet with their fire. Only the one house near the school and the school itself were damaged. The deterioration on the Saigon side was far beyond anything Van could have imagined in Denver. Bao Tri was not a dangerous place to live simply because the Viet Cong menaced it. The demoralized Saigon soldiery were a closer peril. Four soldiers from the 25th Division's M113 company got drunk and started a rumpus at the town's restaurant. At midnight, the police attempted to quiet them down. The soldiers scattered the cops with a fusillade from Thompson submachine guns and several other weapons they had with them. They then decided it was fun to frighten policemen and higher figures of would-be authority, too. For the next three and a half hours, until they got bored and went to sleep, the four soldiers staggered around Bao Tri firing in every direction. They yelled challenges to Han, the new province chief, to the major who was his military deputy, and to every other officer in town to come out and try to stop them. The U.S. home bungalow was a mere 30 yards from the restaurant. Ramsey was in Saigon for the evening, but the area police advisor was spending the night with Van. They lacked the authority to halt the rampage and could only take shelter on the floor and curse whenever a soldier swung a weapon their way. The next morning, Van counted the pockmarks of about 20 bullets on the stucco of the outside walls of the bungalow. He was incredulous that no Saigon officer had taken action to stop four drunks from shooting up a town. At breakfast, he did not hide his contempt from Han. To Van's further amazement, Han and his military deputy pretended that nothing had happened. Van would soon learn that Han and his deputy believed there was nothing they could do. The soldiers were in a state of despair. They had lost respect for their officers and would mutiny if anyone tried to discipline them. Sandy Faust had wondered at 7th Division if Cao was a Viet Cong agent. The intelligence advisor on the province military advisory staff was absolutely convinced that the commander of the 25th Division in Hao Nghia, Kolern Phan Truong Chin, was a communist agent. The previous intelligence advisor had reached the same conclusion. It did not seem possible to behave so consistently, J.Q. Ajie Deneji 1T of the enemy, out of genera incompetence or cowardice and Chin appeared to be a smart man. He had a reputation as an amateur poet. Chin forbade ambushes at night and in the day too, except in friendly territory. He not only did everything he could to avoid attacking the guerrillas himself, he went to pains to keep anyone else from doing so. He interfered so frequently with province operations, altering the plans and forcing Han to send the troops where there was no enemy, that Han too began to suspect that Chin was working for the other side. When Chin ordered airburst artillery fire, even the time fuses on the shells would be set to go off high above the ground and vitiate the effect of the shrapnel. Chin, of course, was not a communist agent no more than Cao had been, and looking back a decade later, Ramsey decided that Chin was probably just terrified of the Viet Cong and thought that his troops would be torn apart if they seriously engaged the enemy. Chin was too cruel to the peasantry targeting hamlets for airstrikes and shelling them with point-detonating ammunition that did blow up houses and blast away people, 
to have been a genuine communist sympathizer. In Haungia in 1965, Van and Ramsey, while not as convinced as the intelligence advisor, also suspected Chin's motives. They had a standing joke between them that he must report nightly to Hanoi. If Chin's purpose was to save the lives of his men, he kept it well hidden. He and his regimental commanders were forever marching columns up and down roads with no troops out on the point and the flanks for security. The result was a monotonous series of slaughters. Between these ambushes and the guerrillas' night attacks, Chin was losing an average of a company a month. The Viet Cong had no need to tear his division apart. He was bleeding it to death for them. The question of where incompetence and stupidity ended and treachery and sabotage began was a real one. Viet Cong penetration of the Saigon side had always been a major problem, and it became an ever graver one as the fortunes of the regime declined and men and women turned their coats to hedge against the future. The suspicion the subversion bred was even more corrosive. No one trusted anyone. In the village headquarters of Trung Lap, north of Bao Trai, where a ranger training center was located, the village chief, the local militia commander, and the head of the training center all accused each other of being Viet Cong agents. The village chief moved elsewhere in fear for his life after a guerrilla commando squad walked into the place one day disguised in ranger uniforms and shot seven genuine rangers. It was hardly surprising that the soldiers would despair in this atmosphere. During Van's first year in Vietnam, Saigon soldiers had used alcohol sparingly while outside of town and in potential danger. Many now drank heavily at night on bivouac in the countryside. They had also taken to smoking marijuana, another reason they may have continued to sleep soundly after the Viet Cong arrived. Their desperation seemed to aggravate the vicious cycle in which they were caught. It magnified their sense of alienation from their own people. Their predatory habits worsened, and they provoked more of the peasantry into conniving with the Viet Cong to kill them, as had happened to the Ranger Company. In their hopelessness, the soldiers seemed almost to offer themselves up to death to end the suspense. Less than two weeks after the Ranger Company died while sleeping at the hamlet two miles from Bao Trai, another company perished in identical fashion while camped at a hamlet four miles south of the town. The habit of falling asleep without security precautions had formerly been confined to militiamen and outposts. It had now become common to almost all of the Saigon forces. In these circumstances, the Viet Cong could behave with near impunity. One night, a 20-man commando invaded Kuchi District Town to kidnap or assassinate two members of the district intelligence squad who had been sufficiently conscientious to irritate the guerrillas in the area. The two intelligence men had the unusual good luck to flee their houses as the guerrillas were breaking inside. The annoyed Viet Cong chased their quarry through the town, across rooftops and down dirt lanes with shouts and shots. The intelligence men eluded them, but the guerrillas did not feel any need to leave. They searched the town for two hours in a vain attempt to find their intended victims. None of the civil guards, now called the Regional Forces or RF and referred to derisively by the advisors as Rough Puffs, who were supposed to be protecting Kuchi, stirred. The district chief was not disturbed by the guerrillas, and he returned the courtesy by doing nothing to help his intelligence men. Nor did any officer appear with a rescue force from the headquarters of a regiment of Chin's division, less than half a mile away in a rubber plantation on the edge of Kuchai. Van and Ramsey later determined that the regimental headquarters had become fully aware of what was occurring. On another evening, a Viet Cong propaganda troop decided to entertain the population of a large village center, just off the main road to Saigon, a few miles west, P.F. Kuchi. The troop set up its show in the village movie theater right across the street from a school where an ARVN company was bivouacked. The propaganda troop was armed and had a small escort. The lieutenant in charge of the company ordered his men to attack the guerrillas they refused. He got in his jeep and drove to Kuchi to ask the district chief what to do. They discussed the problem for a while, and then both of them went out and got drunk. After the death of the first ranger company at the hamlet two miles from Bao Trai, Van wrote a friend in Denver not to hold out any hope that the bombing of the North would alter events in the South, because, regrettably, we are going to lose this war. We're going to lose because of the moral degeneration in South Vietnam, coupled with the excellent discipline of the VC. This country, South Vietnam, has pissed away its opportunities so long, it is now force of habit and apparently nothing is going to change them. I'm bitter. 
not at these ridiculous little Oriental play soldiers, but at our goddamn military geniuses and politicians for refusing to admit and act on the obvious to take over the command of this operation lock, stock, and barrel, but maintaining Vietnamese front men. It is such a hopeless situation that nothing else will work. The little bastard General Kai made a speech today demanding that we invade the North and liberate North Vietnam. The goddamn little fool can't even drive a mile outside of Saigon without an armed convoy, and he wants to liberate the North. How damn ridiculous can you get? During his first year in Vietnam, Van had seen the solution to the war primarily in military terms. The destruction of the regular Viet Cong battalions in order to create enough security to gradually pacify the countryside. The means of destruction was NRVN that would fight. The way to attain such an RVN was through a junta JN Saigon or a strongman who would willingly take American advice or who could be dragooned into accepting American direction by the threat of withholding the military and economic aid that kept South Vietnam alive. In Hao Nghia, Van was learning that the task facing the United States was a much more complicated and intractable one. He was finding out how parasitic and moribund the Saigon side was, some of the reasons for its condition, and how profoundly Saigon society would have to be all shraws changed if it was ever to survive against its communist opponent. The worst of the ills he was encountering, the one from which these other ills of demoralization and indiscipline seemed to rise, was corruption. He had not known before exactly how pervasive it was. He was discovering in Haungia that corruption infected the whole of Saigon society, from Kai and almost all of the other young Turk generals consolidating their power at the center, to the corps and division commanders, through the province and district chiefs and their administrations, to the village policemen blackmailing a farmer into paying him a bribe not to report the farmer as a Viet Cong suspect. The Saigonese form of corruption differed completely in magnitude and nature from the corruption most commonly found in state and local government in the United States. The American variety, while destructive when it grew out of hand, could be a malodorous lubricant for the political machines that got shopping centers and highways and public housing built. Saigonese corruption was incapacitating, a malignancy that poisoned the entire system of government. Graft was the main preoccupation of those on the Saigon side, Van learned, absorbing more time and thought than any other concern, and summoning considerable ingenuity from people who were incompetent at the task they were supposed to perform. At the very time when the Vietnamese on the Saigon side should have been joining together in self-sacrifice and unity to prevent their world from being destroyed, they were hastening its destruction. The greater the peril to their society became, the more viciously they preyed on one another. They seemed to loot with the assumption that they and their families would somehow escape the common disaster at the last moment, or that the Americans would step in and save them. Mostly, Van observed, their greed was too rapacious to permit any thought of its ultimate consequence. He gave Van some of his first lessons on the subject. As province chief, Han was entitled to take his meals in his own quarters. Van and Ramsey began eating with him rather than with the other province officials after his arrival near the end of April. Often Han invited one or two of his subordinates to join them. Just as frequently there were only the three of them. Eating at the province chief's table was a natural thing for the civilian American advisors in a province to do, and it also fit in with Van's hope to organize a concerted effort against the Viet Cong in Haung Gia by managing Han. In these early years, most American advisors, civilian or military, learned relatively little about the intricacies of corruption in South Vietnam because they avoided the subject. They knew that corruption was officially regarded as an embarrassment and that reports about it were not welcome at the embassy or at Westmoreland's headquarters. Their Saigonese counterparts also knew this, and while they gossiped about corruption, they did not press confidences on the Americans. Han an exception within his own system, recognized Van as an American exception. Van also presented himself as an American with connections in high places who might be able to change things. One of the initial lessons Han taught Van was that losses and desertions and the difficulty of recruitment did not by themselves explain why Saigon's fighting units were chronically short of men. At Van's suggestion, Han agreed to rotate his regional forces troops through a refresher training course. 
To try to encourage buttressing of the combat units, the Americans had prevailed on the Ministry of Defense to require that a unit meet a minimum strength figure before it could be admitted to a training center. Han thought he would have no problem with the first unit he selected because its roster showed approximately 140 men, and the training center minimum in this case was about 100. When he mustered the unit, he found 50 men. The other 90 names on the roster represented what the Vietnamese called ghost soldiers and potted tree soldiers. The ghosts were men who had been killed or who had deserted. The potted trees were men who paid bribes for false discharge or leave papers so that they could return to their families or civilian jobs, hence the allusion to an ornamental tree safely ensconced in a pot. The unit commanders pocketed the monthly pay and allowances for these phantoms and domesticated greenery, dividing the profit with more senior officers who protected them. Instead of looking for incentives to recruit soldiers, the Saigon Officer Corps had created a disincentive to keeping its units strong enough to fight. Han was aware of the practice, of course, but he had expected to net 100 troops out of a roster that listed 140. He had the ARVN Major, who was his deputy for military affairs, investigate to determine how much the other RF units were under strength. The Major came back with an unsettling report. It seemed that the RF commander for Haungia ate too much, a phrase for a man who was considered greedy even by Saigon standards, and encouraged his subordinates to pad the rolls excessively. Han's deputy then made a suggestion. He proposed that he and Han cut themselves in on the rake-off. Han decided he had no one on his staff he could trust. He told Van and Ramsey the story and asked them to start taking pictures of RF and Popular Forces units they encountered on their travels in the province. The SDC militia had also been renamed and was now called the Popular Forces, or PF. He intended to compare the photographs with the unit rosters to try to find out how many troops he really did have. Nguyen Trihan was not an exception merely out of personal desire. He had not bought his province chief's job and so did not have to generate graft to pay for the position. Most province and district chiefs in South Vietnam did buy their jobs. Han's predecessor, who had been arrested for involvement in the abortive coup in February, was out of jail by late spring, but still in trouble for another reason. He had bought the post in 1964 when Haungia had been a somewhat safer place. At the time of his arrest, he had not finished paying off his debt to the corps commander who had sold him the province, and the general was pressing him for the money. Han had not been asked to pay for the job because so few men had been willing to take Hao Nghia in the spring of 1965, and he had been appointed by a comparatively honest civilian prime minister, who was soon to be forced out by the generals. Corruption guaranteed incompetence in office, high or low. Professional performance had no bearing on whether men like Chin held division commands. They kept their positions by their facility, at forming corruption alliances with those above them, and at creating other corruption alliances with those below in order to channel money upward. The same pattern of officials generating graft for themselves and higher-ups had prevailed under Diem, with the distinction that the men originally acquired their positions for jeer joyalty to the No Din family. Lines of authority that needed to function if the country was to be governed rationally, and that were already weakened by the influence of family ties and religious and factional connections, were undermined entirely by those networks within networks of graft. Han had virtually no control, for example, over three of the district chiefs in his province, because they were corruption partners of Chin, and the division commander protected them. Chin was trying to coerce Han into firing Jay, the fourth district chief, because the man was independent and competent but would not cooperate sufficiently in graft to please Chin. The Saigon regime had, in fact, evolved a system in which no one was permitted to keep his hands clean. For all to be safe, all had to be implicated. As Ramsay was to remark, the system was designed to ensure that no pot was in a position to call another kettle black. Inflation had undermined salaries during the deem years, and corruption had negated any incentive to increase them to realistic levels. Salaries were so ludicrously low, Han's monthly salary was less than $200 at the official rate of exchange, that a man had to steal something to support his family and maintain his status. The only way an American could distinguish between honest and dishonest officials was to draw a line between those who embezzled what they needed to live and those who enriched themselves. Han was honest by this criterion, as Van had noticed Cao to be at 7th Division. 
It was easier for an American to discern this line than it was for a Vietnamese who had begun stealing to hold to it. Corruption fed on itself. Few men who had bought a job were willing to forego a profit on their investment and a bonus in the bargain for the physical risks involved. There was also the temptation to build a constituency within the system. The province and district chiefs most popular with their staffs usually were those who spread the graft around so that everyone got a share. The system had given rise to a multitude of other distortions that encouraged corruption. One was the role played by the wives. Madame General X or Mrs. Colonel Y often acted as agents for their husbands, frequently dealing with other Madame Generals or Mrs. Colonels. The women liked the role because it gave them power. A woman who was using the shield of her husband's authority to run a graft network acquired a share of that authority in the process. Many of the men also favored the arrangement because it freed them from the tedium of financial details and allowed them to pretend that their wives were just businesswomen and that they were not crooks. There simply was no way for a man to remain truly honest and hold a position at a responsible level. Even if he took only what he needed and kept his wife under control, he still had to permit corruption to go on around him, and he often had to embezzle money for payoff demands by his superiors. If he insisted on honesty to the point of refusing others' access to corruption, he became an outsider and was pushed from office. Han had so far been able to escape with moderate payments to Chin. It was uncertain how long he could continue to get off so lightly. Van had already found out prior to Han's arrival that corruption undermined his USOM pacification programs and that Americans were not beyond its temptation. He discovered that another AID official, not William Pai, his immediate predecessor, had been allowing the Vietnamese contractor in the province to steal USOM cement and other building materials in exchange for women. Construction materials were bringing spectacular prices on the black market in Saigon. Because of the rush of Vietnamese and Chinese speculators to build housing, to rent to the thousands of Americans coming into the country. Cement was especially golden. The contractor had included his wife among the women he had provided the aid official. While it might seem difficult to imagine circumstances in which John Vami would refuse free sex, sex as bribery was one of them. Van did not, of course, renounce sex because of his assignment to Hao Nghia. He behaved as he had at 7th Division. He confined his sexual adventures to his trips to Saigon and presented himself as a model of probity while in the province. The idea that any American would allow himself to be bribed into winking at the theft of government supplies in wartime was also loathsome to Van. He was outraged at the man and outraged at the contractor for taking advantage of the man's weakness. The eagerness for graft was sabotaging use on programs in more subtle ways than outright theft. The Hamlet Elementary School's USOM financed had an appeal for the peasants because the farmers wanted their children to be educated. When the Haungia contractor built a school, he put it up as shoddily as possible, and the benches and desks for he provided were so poorly fabricated they did not last a year. The AID official had also been induced to look the other way on matters like this, and the province and district officials always ignored the cheating because the contractor was naturally bribing them too. Similarly, USOM won funds marked for self-help projects to stimulate participation by the peasantry, ended up going into hamlet and village offices that were subsequently abandoned or wrecked by the Viet Cong. Province officials kept proposing the construction of such buildings because they got a rake-off on each one. Van wanted to carry out the original purpose of the program and let the peasants choose what they wanted, probably another school or a clinic and then give them the cement and roofing and other materials to build it themselves, so that they would take care of it and discourage the guerrillas from harming it. The province officials opposed the idea, because they would be deprived of their graft. Corruption's biggest customer was the Viet Cong. Corruption gave the guerrillas all sorts of advantages. A resources and population control program instigated by the Americans was supposed to restrict the movement of guerrilla sympathizers and to deny the Viet Cong medicines and other useful commodities. Americans new to South Vietnam attributed the persistence of the Saigon regime's complicated edicts and regulations to the influence of French colonialism. They did not understand that each requirement and prohibition served as a pretext for graft. The regulations issued under the control program were an L excuse to ask higher prices for contraband goods. The guerrillas did not limit their purchases to such forbidden items as antibiotics, 
and surgical instruments and dry cell batteries for hand detonators to set off mines. They bought items the Americans had not thought to put on the contraband list, like false identification cards, security clearances for spies seeking jobs with U.S. agencies, almost anything they wanted. Corruption in turn raised money to help the Viet Cong finance these purchases and bribes. There was, for example, a large sugar mill in Haun Gia, at Hiep Hoa, northwest of Bao Tri, that processed cane grown by the farmers. The mill was jointly owned by French interests and the Saigon government. The regime's share was leased to Chinese businessmen in Cholon, who split the profits with whoever was in power. The mill was located in the midst of a guerrilla-dominated area, and yet it was never bothered. Van noticed that the manager and other supervisors felt sufficiently remote from the danger of bullets and explosions to have plate glass windows in their houses. The mill's trucks were never stopped while hauling processed sugar into Saigon. The Viet Cong obtained annual taxes from the mill of 1.7 million piesters, Van was told. The Hiep Hoa sugar mill was not unique. Commercial enterprises from which Saigon officials gained profits and the Viet Cong derived taxes existed all over South Vietnam. The guerrilla tax collectors provided signed receipts for the payments stamped with the seal of the National Liberation Front. The Viet Cong's clandestine government. Trafficking with the guerrillas had a special way of feeding on itself because it was, at least officially, a crime punishable by death. Once someone on the Saigon side had started down the road, the communists could enlarge future air quests under the threat of blackmail. American intelligence officers sometimes wondered why more guerrilla operatives from district and province committee levels were not captured, accidentally if for no other reason. They were caught on occasion and then frequently bought out of their cells before the Americans could discover that a valuable catch had been made. The communists had some problems with corruption in the regime in the North, but the circumstances of the struggle in the South militated against corruption in their organization there. The path to a responsible position in the Viet Cong and then to party membership was too arduous and dangerous to attract men who were motivated by money. The Com. Munist leaders also took measures to prevent corruption from infecting the guerrilla ranks. They held up the example of its evil on the Saigon side and punished venality whenever they discovered it with a trial and a lengthy term of re-education in a rainforest labor camp or a bullet in the back of the head.